Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited about this next session. It's wonderful for the Abbey to be able to welcome Richard Carney to its stage. We're very pleased. Um, I'd like to first of all introduce uh, uh, Peter Crawley, who's going to in turn introduce Richard Carney to you. So uh, Peter, as you know, is chief theatre critic of the Irish Times and acting editor of Irish Theatre Magazine. He's also a journalist and columnist, indeed often staunch critic of the Abbey Theatre. <laughs> he recently curated Voyage and Return, a symposium on Irish theatre and diaspora for the Dublin Theatre Festival and for Trinity College, supported by the Gatherick. Will you please now welcome Peter Crawley. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, it's a great honour uh, to be able to introduce Professor Richard Carney, a uh, keynote speaker of Theatre and Memory Symposium, um, and his address today, which is entitled Writing Trauma from Memory to Fiction. Um, in fact, as Aiding sort of alluded to, um, it was a delightful surprise uh, to be invited uh, to, to, to make the introduction, which, which I thought spoke of a great uh, magnanimity and tolerance on behalf of the Abbey Theatre um, and Aiding to allow a critic onto this side of the divide. Um, uh, it's a, a, a spirit of, I think, of um, charity and optimism, because I think if you look at my academic um, philosophical record, um, it's a job for which I'm afraid I'm dangerously underqualified. Um, in fact, you could think of it perhaps as a very elaborate and subtle form of revenge to, uh, to, to uh, plunge me into the field of deep thinking and just see whether or not I could stay afloat. Um, it's, I'm afraid, not testament to sort of my critical reasoning or uh, the capacities of my intellect and much more a glowing testament to Richard Carney's writing um, and his sharp and, I think, inviting intelligence that he writes on such a range of complex issues um, and allows even people like I access um, to any idea that he feels is worth imparting. Born in Cork, educated in Glenstall Abbey in Limerick, and having studied in University College Dublin, Montreal's McGill University, and the, and the University of Paris, where he gained his doctorate while encountering uh, renowned uh, philosopher Paul Ricoeur, uh, about whom he's written extensively, and Jacques Derrida, Professor Richard Carney has established himself in Ireland and abroad as a renowned cultural critic, historian, essayist, commentator, a venerated figure in hermeneutics, a branch of contemporary philosophy concerned with textual interpretation. He has long inhabited the role of public intellectual, bringing an inquiry mind to pressing social matters. Um, I think one example of that might be his work in Ireland in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, working alongside figures such as John Hume and Mary Robinson, um, work in which he helped to articulate new ways of thinking about what it meant to be Irish. Uh, so much so that when the Good Friday Agreement was declared in 1998 um, and Catholics and Protestants were said to be able to choose their citizenship, um, it wasn't difficult to see, to see uh, Professor Carney's contribution to its own philosophy. In his book, Post-Nationalist Ireland, Politics, Literature, Philosophy, uh, Professor Carney argued against a rhetoric of purity and purification and towards an Irish identity that was not uniform but pluriform. Carney has maintained, I think, the honour uh, to the status of public intellectual, someone who has brought philosophy and critical thinking to bear on such pressing matters and asked important questions of narrative and nation, the stories we tell ourselves to ourselves and to others and the reasons why we tell such stories. Carney has been so prolific uh, across so many subjects that it's actually hard to be exact about the number of his written titles. Uh, it's really more like an official estimate at the moment. Uh, he's written well over 20 books on original subjects. He's edited about as many more. Um, he's found himself the subject of philosophical collections. Um, at any given time, he seems to have about half a dozen books on the go. These volumes speak, I think, volumes. Uh, about his interests. Um, the titles alone, Modern Movements in European Philosophy, or Poetics of Imagining, Modern and Postmodern. Um, and though he has retreated from Irish life, as I think he put it once, um, by moving to uh, America in 99, following a series of visiting professorships um, in France and elsewhere, um, he's been based in, since 1999, 
in um, Boston, where he holds the Charles B. Selig Chair of Philosophy at Boston College. But Irish life hasn't quite retreated from Richard Carney's concerns. Um, his analysis of an always changing Ireland has found expression in such works as trans Transition, Narratives in Modern Irish Culture, Post-Nationalist Ireland, as I mentioned, or more recently, Navigation, his collection of essays on Irish subjects which spanned 30 years of inquiry across many forms, cultural and artistic. The territories of the imagination and the sacred have been two particularly fertile areas for his philosophical writing. In his wide-ranging consideration of the purpose and use of narratives in a book entitled On Stories, Carney could draw references from Ulysses and Schindler's List, the stories of individuals and national narratives, or find congruences of thought in people such as the anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss, who called myths machines for the suppression of time, and J.R.R. Tolkien, who considered stories as the great escape from death. Carney's identified stories as a necessary address towards suffering, both physical and psychic, as much for the writer as the reader. And just as he has cogently analyzed the necessity of national narratives and problems around them, the myths of purity and exclusion that we tell ourselves to reinforce what Benedict Anderson has called the imagined community of nation, he has also revealed the trauma of famine, of disinheritance, poverty, of what he has termed priest-ridden philistinism, loss of language and emigration as a source of psychic pain in the writings of Yeats, Singh, Joyce, or even Beckett. Stories, according to Carney, can thus be creative solutions for actual problems. Narrative fiction doesn't work so much as an escape as a survival mechanism, one that offers catharsis, a working through trauma, where fiction can be a form of healing or transformation. In his writings on matters sacred, which you would consider unusual terrain for a philosopher uh, in the contemporary age, Carney has sought new approaches towards our idea of God, an entity or a notion that has been under sustained attack from writers such as Dawkins or Hitchens. In The God Who May Be, A Hermeneutics of Religion, his book from 2001, Carney helped to keep religion in the academic conversa conversation, and this he has done with an almost regal bow of sensitivity and consideration towards other attitudes. I quote, if I would say that I hail from a Catholic tradition, it is with this proviso, where Catholicism offends love and justice, I prefer to call myself a Judeo-Christian theist. And where this tradition so offends, I prefer to call myself religious in the sense of seeking God in a way that neither excludes other religions nor purports to possess the final truth. And where the religious so offends, I would call myself a seeker of love and justice to core. That intellectual compassion was stirringly coupled with his 2003 book, written, of course, in the aftermath of 9-11, Strangers, Gods, and Monsters, Interpreting Otherness. In this book, he saw the demonization on both sides of the so-called war on terror, and described, uh, in which each side described the other as monstrous. To abate that cycle for how can anyone understand, let alone identify with someone that they refer to as evil, Carney proposed an attitude adjustment through what he termed diacritical hermeneutics. This makes the foreign more familiar and the familiar more foreign, so as to make us more hospitable to strangers, gods and monsters, without succumbing to mystique or madness, he wrote. It's easy to see those concerns animating some of his more recent projects, such as the Guest Book Project, which explores the interface between religions and cultures um, and uses a multimedia enterprise which examines themes of violence and reconciliation, the meeting again of hosts and strangers, in a number of divided cities, including, as he mentioned this morning on Pat Kenny's show on News Talk, at Derry, Londonderry. Significantly, it involves school children engaging with the practices of tolerance, respect, and mutual recognition, another healing narrative for the wounds of history. His most recent book, Anatheism, Returning to God After God, might be seen as a similar effort in reconciliation, not so much about religion, as he has said, as an attitude of mind in which we may retrieve what remains in religion. Writing on the ethics of memory, Carney has offered a persuasive defense of making narratives out of history. This is not narrative in the sense of a fictive strategy necessarily, or storytelling as an invention. 
but narrative as a way that reconstructs the past to enable us to present it to ourselves more vividly. By imposing narrative shape on history, he has argued, we honor the ethical entreaty to respect the reality of the past, to see ourselves in another era, to bring the past into the light of view, and so we can make us, and so to make us feel as if we were really there. During a decade of centenaries from the 1913 lockout, which we see commemorated on this stage, to the First World War, to the Easter Rising, this usefully reaffirms the, reaffirms the role, I think, in art, in reviving and challenging stories, narratives, and testimonies of history. Carney also recognizes that this approach demands ethical vigilance, a proper dialectic between empath empathetic belief and critical disbelief, so that history is not simply something written by the victors or simplified into an official pageantry. Testimony, in fact, he has argued, is the narrative supplied by the suffering, a preservation of past trauma that cannot be sterilized or neutralized by impassive historiography. Following the ideas of Paul Ricoeur, with whom he studied, Carney has written, the more narratives singularize, sorry, the more narratives singularizes historical memories, the more we strive to understand them, and the more we understand them, the better able we are in the long run to explain them. And he says, rather than simply suffer them again as emotional trauma. Now, might the same be true of memory and fiction? In a recent essay, which may be the basis of today's paper, entitled Writing Trauma, Carney wondered how literature helps us to work through trauma, what the limits of narrative catharsis might be, the purging of pity or fear, as Aristotle defined it, and how narrative healing differs in the case of little trauma, which is to say the personal traumas of birth or loss or death, and big trauma, which is to say societal catastrophes, such as war or torture or the Holocaust. In the case of Joyce's Ulysses or William Shakespeare's Hamlet, both of which deal with what he calls transgenerational trauma carried from father to son, and which were written by men with what you might consider to be analogous wounds. These personal traumas are mediated through creative words and transformed from wounds into scars. So the talking cure, beloved of psychologists and psychotherapists, might find an equivalent in the writing cure for both author and reader, or in the case of theatre, for watcher. In the context of a symposium on memory and theatre, held in a space as suffused with history and memory as the Abbey Theatre, it's inevitable to reflect on how memory functions in Irish theatre, both personally and politically. When Sean O'Casey remembered the events of the 1916 Rising just 10 years after they had occurred from the perspective of the marginalised or the heroism of classically unheroic figures, it was more than enough to challenge another act of remembering, that of Comon the Bon, the Mon, veterans of the Rising, who liked not the juxtaposition of a prostitute and Patrick Pierce speaking of bloodshed as a purifying, cleansing act, uh, were moved to object and to riot. You have disgraced yourself again, everybody remembers WB8 saying whether or not they were there. Uh, who recalls, though, that an audience member concluded that speech by throwing a shoe at him? Christopher Morash actually uh, recalls that. Uh, I take the detail from his history of Irish theatre, uh, one of many that I relish. We don't need to look too far to see other traumas animating the Irish stage and Irish work internationally. The sweet smell of the air of Balia Bjug in 1833, Brian Friel's setting for translations, which signals the potato blight and the dawn of the famine, which, with the loss of language and identity, counts as a double form of dispossession. Considering his own responses to the great hunger in his play Famine in 1968, Tom Murphy said, somebody told me once it takes nine generations to get rid of the racial memory. While I was researching Famine, I asked myself, am I a student of Famine or a victim of Famine? I finally decided that I was a victim, and it was from that viewpoint that I wrote the play. At recent revivals of Famine from Druid Theatre Company, or indeed the Abbey's recent production of The House, it's from that viewpoint of victimhood, perhaps, that the audience may still watch, and perhaps why it resonates so deeply with us still. From the shell shock of Observe the Sons of Ulster marching towards the Somme, Frank McGuinness' celebrated memory play, to the personal trauma trailed ostensibly as a wistful comedy in Hugh Leonard's Da, or the anti-nostalgia of remembrance in Dancing at Lunasa or Faith Healer, the unsayable pain 
of Murphy's extraordinary Balliac and Goyra, uh, which he is tellingly revisiting, late, revisiting later this year in a new play called Bridget, or necessary acts of testimony on institutional abuse, such as in Mary Raftery's No Escape, which has been staged in a region tonight in, in the Peacock, uh, Louise Lowe's Laundry for a New, Broken Talkers, The Blue Boy, and countless others, wounds in theatre are slow to heal and traumas die hard. Carney's writing has given us, I think, useful ways of mediating these enduring conflicts. I was struck by an argument, in fact, reported on yesterday's symposium, um, in which the playwright and politician Mannix Flynn voices concern about how testimonial theatre or memorials uh, on issues of institutional abuse may count as premature closure, that it was too soon, in other words. And it put me in mind of something that Richard had written about catharsis, a useful explanation that catharsis was not understood as closure or completion, rather that narrative catharsis was about an impossible story, storytelling which forever fails to cure trauma, but never fails to try to heal it. It's tempting to see that the memory of trauma in life and art is more of a process than an exorcism, much like the peace process, not something that resolves in a product, but something that we forever adhere to, that we forever return to. That's something also that it appears to me the theatre is distinctly well equipped to do. Theatre deals in memory because theatre is memory. It requires memory for creation, for performance, and it aspires to exist in our memory forever afterwards. It's not stored in a retrieval system so easily, other than our own failing bockety recall. The experience of reading Richard Carney on literature or theatre or film or culture or society is to encounter, as I say, a generous and insightful intellect, one that makes complex ideas accessible even to people like me, who find the term phenomenological hermeneutics hard enough to pronounce, never mind fathom. I came to his work, I must confess, daunted by its immensity and its broad range of concerns, but I plunged into it, I have to equally well confess, as a fan. He brings, to us, he brings us to familiar places sometimes, to stories and texts with which we are quite familiar, and yet he seems to discover something wholly new within them. He traces the course and responsibility of human imagination and the redemptive possibility of putting ourselves in the place of others, something that the theatre is also very well equipped to do. And he traces the scaffold of fiction and narrative as ways to better hold up our realities, to make them comprehensible to ourselves, and to allow us the possibility, perhaps, of improving them. His appeal is to the head and to the heart. It's to see things differently. It's to think things differently, and perhaps to remember things differently. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to give you your keynote speaker, Professor Richard Carney, in his new paper, Writing Trauma from Memory to Fiction. Well, I can go home now. <laughs> um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Peter, for an, an, an incredibly generous uh, introduction. And um, in many respects, what I have to say will supplement much of what you have just said. <laughs> and you have opened it up uh, it, to a larger canvas than I will be able to um, address, which I'm... I'm I'm very glad about, um, linking what I will now say in a much more limited way to what's going on in drama, in contemporary Irish drama, the references to Tom Murphy, that wonderful um, citation about the nine generations that we have to work through and we're not sure whether we, we're commenting on it or we're victims of it. And then, of course, the work of Brian Friel, the work of Frank McGuinness, Marina Mary Raftery, Marina Carr, and, and so many others who have worked on this very question of memory and trauma and turning uh, flesh, wounded flesh, into fiction. So what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes or so, um, so as to hopefully leave at least half an hour for question and answer, is to take three uh, narratives, Homer's uh, uh, Ulysses, The Odyssey, um, Shakespeare's Hamlet, so there I am talking about theatre, and uh, Joyce's Ulysses. And to suggest, as Peter has said, that uh, here we find three examples of transgenerational trauma. Each begins with a wound and attempts to transform it or transfigure it 
into a scar that can be lived with, writing as a scarring of wounds. Wounds, wounds being basically incurable, timeless, as Freud said, um, and unsayable, ineffable, unthinkable, unimaginable. That's what wounds are. Trauma is Greek for wound. And then scars are the attempt to somehow register that uh, in the body as felt or as written in a body of writing. So I'll start with Joyce and then the origin of, of uh, Ulysses and then work back through Hamlet and uh, Homer before returning finally to Joyce and opening it up for discussion. My water. There we are. So James Joyce, in a letter to his brother Stanislas on November 13, 1906, announces that he's just started what he calls a short story. It's going to be called Ulysses. He came up with the idea, he explains to his brother, because of a memory triggered by a recent mugging in a street in Rome. He'd just been fired from his job at the bank and drunk all his severance pay, which should have paid the rent and helped provide for his one-year-old son, Giorgio. But on his way home, Joyce was robbed and left lying in the gutter, destitute, despondent, and bleeding. In fact, it, had, it took place just outside the Abbey Theatre. And it was that very moment, sorry, it was at that very moment that he suddenly remembered something that had occurred just outside the Abbey Theatre. That is, being assaulted several years previously in Dublin, June 22, 1904, and rescued from the gutter by a man called Hunter. I quote, a cuckolded Jew who dusted him down and took him home for a cup of cocoa. In true Samaritan fashion, as he added. This repetition of woundings triggered a lost memory where an immigrant Jew came to the rescue of a wounded Dubliner and planted a seed of caritas in his imagination. Now, several weeks after the Rome mugging, Joyce and Nora were given tickets to an opera whose librettist was called Blum, B-L-U-M. This second moment of happenstance after his humiliating fall in a Roman side street furnished the name of his pater paternal protagonist, Leopold Blum. Thus was born the longest short story ever told, <laughs> Ulysses, the tale of a father and a son traversing wounds on the way to healing. So my subject this evening is the writing cure. And my questions are the following. How might literature or theater, perhaps in particular, help us work through trauma? How far can narrative catharsis go and what are its limits? Catharsis being this healing function that Aristotle talks about in the poetics. The function of drama is catharsis, purgation of our passions of pity and fear by distilled pity and fear. We'll come back to it if we have time. And finally, how might narrative healing differ in the case of little trauma, the existential wounds of birth, loss, and death, which we all experience, and big trauma, war, torture, catastrophe? So my chosen example, as I mentioned, is Joyce's Ulysses, itself a story which rewrites two other stories, Shakespeare's Hamlet and Homer's Odyssey. All three are stories of fathers and sons, stories of transgenerational trauma, which I'm suggesting are transmitted and somehow transfigured in the writing of the stories themselves. In the opening of Joyce's Ulysses, we're told by Heinz that it's all about the father and the son idea. I quote, the son striving to be atoned with the father. And it doesn't take long for us to realize that the son is Stephen Telemachus and the father is Bloom Ulysses. Their paths cross in the middle of the book as Stephen exits and Bloom enters the National Library here in Dublin. It's a pivotal scene in which Stephen expounds his complex but central theory of the father-son idea in Hamlet. Stephen's thesis is that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet the year his son Hamlet died at the age of 11 and his own father, John Shakespeare, was dying. The play, therefore, is about the transmission of mortal trauma between fathers and sons. In short, according to Stephen, Shakespeare wrote the book of himself in order to avoid the madness of melancholy, in order to properly mourn, to use Freud's distinction, his father and his son in a way that he was unable to do in life. 
The play itself then serves as a symbolic working through of an otherwise irresolvable crisis in which a father, King Hamlet, commands his son, Prince Hamlet, to do something impossible. That is to remember what cannot be remembered, to tell something that cannot be told, a double injunction, an unbearable burden, an impossible story, the double bind of trauma. To speak is impossible, not to speak is impossible. As Dari Laub has said about Holocaust trauma in his book Trauma, Explorations in Memory, but also as Edmund Burke wrote about the famine. It's something we have to speak about, but it's something which commands silence. The words of the ghost, Hamlet to his son Hamlet, remember me, remember me. But that I am forbid to tell the stories of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul. In other words, the ghost's unspeakable secrets for which he's condemned the latency of purgatory, what he calls those sulfurous and tormenting flames, these very things are precisely what remain secret. The secret crimes committed in his days of nature, his days of youth, are, King Hamlet tells us, forbidden tales. In short, the things to be remembered by young Hamlet cannot be told in the first place. So we're concerned here, I suggest, with traumas unspeakable things which we do not possess but which possess us, like spectres. For traumas, as Cathy Carruth writes, describe, quote, overwhelming experiences of sudden or catastrophic events in which the response to the event occurs in the often delayed and uncontrolled repetitive occurrence of hallucinations and other intrusive phenomena, end of quote. I think Hamlet perfectly qualifies. Cathy Carruth is one of the founders of trauma studies in the United States with Dari Laub. Now, if this reading of Ulysses sounds psychoanalytic, it's because it is. Joyce himself admitted to being deeply interested in Jung and Freud when he was, as he put it in Fringen's Wake, young and easily Freudened. <laughs> and the story is well known of him bringing his daughter Lucia to visit Jung in Zurich, only to be told by Jung that he would be as, incur in as incurably psychotic as his daughter if he had not penned Ulysses. Writing his book of transgenerational trauma, Ulysses and Telemachus, King and Prince Hamlet, Stephen and Bloom, was, it seemed, the writing cure for Joyce's own trauma, the book of himself, as Stephen says. And Joyce concedes the creative liaison between literature and life when he confesses it's a brave man who would invent something that never happened. Not exactly what structuralist or formalist orthodoxy would claim when it's all about the text and has nothing to do with the author of the text, the content of the text, the reference of the text to a world of action and suffering, or indeed the reader, the receiver of the text. What happens in Ulysses happened to Joyce. He was a manic magpie who, by his own admission, gleaned every word of his story from the stories of history, personal or collective. As he says, it's a book of stolen telling. Storytelling is stolen telling. His fiction is haunted by what he called the nightmares of history, the mute mothers of memory that cry out to be heard, spoken, written. Phantasmal hauntings torment the young Stephen with the agonbite of inwit, guilt, the repetition of the ghost, the mother coming back, the revenant that comes back. They revisit him obsessively, guiltily, ineluctably. Both Hamlet and Ulysses relate such ghostings of narrative memory. As for Freud, no such meeting took place. But I sometimes imagine Joyce reading Freud's seminal theory of trauma in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, published in 1920, as Joyce, voracious reader, was completing Ulysses in 1922. And wondering, as he read this book in this imaginary scenario, when he came to the famous Fort das scene, if it did not confirm his own theory of catharsis as enunciated by Stephen in the portrait. Recall how Freud witnessed his grandson Ernst's first spoken words, gone, back again, fort, da, while playing with a wooden cotton reel, which he made vanish, this is the little Ernst, his grandson, under his curtained cot, and then reappear again in imitation of his mother's coming and going from the house, a cause of unbearable separation anxiety for the young child. In Freud's famous account of Ernst's first two syllables, fort, da, invented to compensate for the little trauma 
of his parents' absence, mother away, father at war, this was 1915, might not Joyce have recognized echoes of his own fictional ploy to compensate for intolerable loss? In other words, might not both Freud and Joyce have witnessed the magical power of words to work through Durchabeitung, as Freud puts it, to work through wounds, albeit at very different levels? Working through as writing through. And more precisely, when Freud wrote of his grandson's loss of his mother, was he not also writing about his own loss of his daughter, the same person, Sophie Freud? For Sophie was significantly Freud's favorite daughter who died tragically in January 1920, several months before Freud, devastated, absolutely devastated by the loss, wrote the fourth da scene. And the scene, incidentally, is inserted in the book's narrative quite abruptly after Freud's initial outline of a series of examples of World War I trauma. And this interpolation of a little trauma, his grandson's separation anxiety, into Freud's uh, seminal account of big trauma, unspeakable violence at war, opens up, I think, the whole conversation about relations between ordinary and extraordinary trauma. How do you understand a trauma victim, a Holocaust survivor, for example, if you haven't been uh, in the Holocaust? Some people, uh, including Claude Landsman, would say you can't. Adorno, after Auschwitz, who can write poetry, who can tell stories, who can imagine what happened? Nobody. To try to do so, to try to create narratives or catharsis or any kind of healing is an abomination. That was Landsman's rebuke to um, uh, Schindler's List, Spielberg's film. We can come back to that later. But it seems to me very interesting that Freud interpolated quite out of the blue, just after his daughter's death, um, this description of a little child playing with a spool of cotton and in so doing, creating a drama. I mean, if Ulysses was the shortest story ever told, this is even shorter, two words, forta. And in that reenactment of a drama, the child repeats the separation and then the coming back of the mother. There's a, there's a performance uh, healing in this sense. And so by interpolating that, he's also interpolating his own trauma. Freud was not at war, but he's now able to listen to trauma victims because not only has he got a good imagination, a good empathic imagination, as Peter mentioned earlier, but also because he knows he's lost his daughter. And so he realizes that everybody in a way can listen to the trauma, the wounds of others, because we are all at a certain level traumatized. Birth and death are traumatic experiences. We'll come back to that. A lot of contemporary trauma um, discussion, particularly in the continent, uh, centers around this phrase, trauma speaks to trauma. If you don't speak from your wound, you can't actually listen to the other person. So if you haven't been the subject of rape or massacre or torture, how can you hear or even begin to heal others? My suggestion here is that the mirror play of Sophie Freud's disappearance enacted between her father, Freud, and her son, Ernst, is a microdrama of transgenerational trauma with a small t. It signals a crossing of identifications where Freud is at once Sophie's father and son, writing the book of himself, as Joyce puts it, so as to mourn a departed loved one, a lost object, Freud's language, namely Sophie. His grandson and he himself are mourning the same person. My corollary suggestion is that Joyce may have found writerly resonances in Freud's therapeutic narrative of Forta, the longest short story ever told, echoing the shortest. This hypothesis is, of course, pure fantasy on my behalf. But Joyce, as you all know, was a voracious reader, and he does have his Finnegan's Wake narrator boast, I can tsukuna lose myself any time I want. And incidentally, in his uh, poem, um, The Holy Office, he declares himself as a healer of, of catharsis. Myself unto myself to give this name catharsis purgative. Um, Joyce was a doctor who never finished his medical studies. He wrote books instead, happily for us. So to return to Ulysses. When Stephen tells us that 
Hamlet is the story of Shakespeare's father-son relationship. He's echoing his relationship with his own father, fathers, Mr. Dedalus and Bloom, his surrogate father. And this story within a story is, please bear with me, itself a parody of Homer's original story of Ulysses and Telemachus, from which, of course, Joyce takes the title of his work. In other words, we're dealing here with stories within stories within stories. Narrative as catharsis. But not narrative catharsis understood as closure or completion, as a cure. No, there is no cure for wounds. Rather, narrative is impossible story. Storytelling which forever fails to cure trauma, but never fails to try to heal it. And in this very effort itself, there is pleasure as Aristotle says, the pleasurable purgation or distillation of pity and fear. Pity as a pathological passion capable of destroying the citizen, being transfigured by drama, says Aristotle, into empathy, compassion. Fear as another pathological passion capable of corrupting citizens, the citizens of Athens, is transformed by drama, by mimesis mythos. Mythos is a plot, implotted imitation of an action. Transformation of fear as pathological into fear as serenity. A good uh, equivalent perhaps can be found in Yeats's term, Laplace Lazuli, gaiety transfiguring all that dread. It's that sense of, for, for uh, Yeats in that moment, of, of the Buddhist sage looking at the world and seeing it by. It's fear in that sense. Uh, what Stephen Dedalus in the portrait calls knowledge of the hidden cause. You become aware. It's a wisdom, um, a serenity. So it's this back and forth. It's a fourth da. Catharsis as pity and fear is da, identification with the suffering person. Again, I quote Dedalus. And thought, the distance the necessary distance that comes under the name fear. Okay, now let's go back to the beginning. Homer's Ulysses. It's a standard motif of Greek myth that sons act like fathers before them, like father, like son, and so on, infinitum, until someone says, stop. That someone is the true storyteller who transposes the regressive repetition of trauma in life into a cathartic repetition in narrative. So that repetition backwards blocked, compulsive acting out and repetition, becomes a repeating forwards. It gives a future to the past rather than locking the past in the past. Think of the great cyclical myths, Greek myths. Zeus castrating Saturn, castrating Uranus. Orestes reiterating the curse of the house of Atreus. Or perhaps most famously, Oedipus repeating the deeds of his father, Laios. Recall. Laius raped the son of his host, Pelops, thereby committing the equivalent of incest and the betrayal of hospitality, the worst crime for the Greeks. His double transgression replicates the curse, or ate, of his own father, Lapticus, and is repeated by Oedipus in the next generation. So the continuing narrative lineage comes under the heading of the house of Lapticus and involves a recurring acting out of unspoken traumata, i.e. wounds, in this case over three generations, not like Tom Murphy's famine, seven generations. But actually, when you go deep into the Greek myths, it's more than three. It's four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. Now, Levi Strauss, the, the Belgian anthropologist and structuralist, has remarked how the three names of patrilinear descent in the story, Labdicus means lame, Laios means left-sided, hobbled, Oedipus swollen-footed, all refer to wounds which cause difficulties in walking. And this fact he suggests, which is symptomatic of a transfer of trauma over three generations and four, if one includes Antigone and wishes to open the discussion to fathers and daughters and by extension to contemporary feminist readings, which is a very good idea, but work for another day. So what we have here is a symptom of a transfer of trauma over generations. The only solution to this curse of cyclical repetition of the wounding is the conversion of the untold wound into some form of telling. In this case, the symbolic plotment of Oedipus's tragic narrative. Only this, according to Levi Strauss, following 
on from Aristotle's Poetics, can bring some sort of catharsis which suspends through the purging of pity and fear the compulsive acting out of mute trauma. The basic thesis in sum is that myths are machines for the purging of wounds, strategies for resolving at a symbolic level what remains irresolvable at the level of lived empirical experience. Now, human existence is cursed by a tragic because impossible desire to escape the trauma of our autochthonous origins. I'm still with Levi-Strauss. Namely, the desire to buck our finitude, to deny death. In the Oedipus cycle, this tragic curse is epitomized by the patrilinear names for wounds that bind us to the earth, Labdicus, Laos, Oedipus, and the poetic role of mythos mimesis that comprises tragic drama, as Aristotle says, is to narrate our heroic desires to transcend our terrestrial nature. So you have Cadmus killing the dragon, Oedipus defeating the Sphinx, and so on. It's what Levi-Strauss calls mythemes. These, these scenes repeat themselves throughout the cycle. But our desires are ultimately impossible. Tragedies are impossible stories in that respect because we're scarred by contrary and irreconcilable fidelities to the earth from which we hail and arrive, and to sky to which we aspire, to imminence and transcendence, to finity and infinity, matter, spirit, nature, culture. For Levi-Strauss, great mythic narratives are therefore attempts to procure cathartic relief by balancing these binary opposites in symbolic constellations. In a word, what is impossible in reality becomes possible in fiction. So how I, might we relate this reading to the father-son story of Ulysses and Telemachus. Let me say a quick word about Homer's version and then proceed to Joyce's. Ulysses is condemned to act out the wound of his own failure, his own existential finitude again and again in the Odyssey. He's absented himself from the wounds of his birth and upbringing, his autochthonous origins in Ithaca, sailing off to heroic glory in Troy. But his attempts to become an immortal warrior are constantly countered by reminders of his mortality, the brutal carnage of Troy and subsequent calamities. We could give a long list. The breaking of the lure of Calypso is also central to this increasing disillusionment. Originally leaving Ithaca as an aspirant hero, Ulysses returns as a beggar a lowly outcast only recognized by the smell of his flesh by his dog Argos and the scar on his thigh by his nurse Eurycleia. It is significant that Eurycleia only touches her master's scar after a detailed narrative about how Ulysses received the original wound in a childhood hunting incident with his grandfather Autolycus. Yet another example of transgenerational trauma. Note that this narrative working through, leading up to the final healing touch of, the, of, of Odysseus by the nursemaid, takes all of 77 lines. Point being that if there is a healing, there's no cure for wounds, but if there's a healing of scars, first they have to be exposed. Nobody has seen Odysseus' scar. They have to be exposed and touched. There has to be something touching about the healing sensory and sensible, carnal, embodied, and something narrative, linguistic. In that sense, it's an ambidextrous healing. We hear the story of, of Odysseus, which we have not learned up until this point, including the origin, not only of his wound, but of his name. Odysseus means the bearer of suffering, the bearer of pain. That's been hidden from us, the reader, and from Odysseus himself. So, the revelation that comes, the partial revelation, is through this double-handed act of uh, touching the scar and also narrating the wound. It's interesting, it's just a note, but that uh, Homer plays with the roots of the word Argos, uh, the dog, it's called Argos, but Telemachus is, expects his father to come back as this great triumphal, you know, quasi-divine hero. And, and the word uses uh, is argentine, hence our word um, in Latin, argentum, argent in French, silver, that which shines. He's expecting a glorious body and spirit to return, but what actually turns up is this stranger, this, this mendicant, this wounded beggar. Telemachus, expecting the triumphant victor to return, victor, a triumphant victor to return, does not at first recognize his own father, 
He's so fixated on his great expectations of the father that he does not see the scar on his body. He's blinded by illusory imagos, projections. Delusions abound. When he finally acknowledges that the mortified stranger before him is in fact his real father, they sit down together and eat, sharing simple food of the earth, squatting in a swineherd's den, is how they finally come together as host and guest. Hospitality is antidote to the hostile curse of fate. Of course, the same word, xenos, can mean, as in all Indo-European languages, uh, an enemy or guest. Uh, as hostess in Latin originally meant, meant friend, uh, guest at the table, and then became, became enemy. And in fact, for a very long time, uh, had both sense. Guest, guest in, in the Germanic lang languages likewise. So there's this movement, impossible movement, from hostility to hospitality. And of course, Joyce in Ulysses is going to play on this because he takes the name of the swineherd in the humblest of dwellings there for Maus and plays with the inn of Maus in the Christian story where Christ breaks bread with the two disciples and is recognized again in touch, in taste. Um, not in uh, some glorious revelation on the road to Emmaus, even though he explicates the scriptures, nobody recognizes him. Joyce plays on this. And then, of course, it becomes a cabman shelter where Bloom and Stephen come together in a moment of at least temporary hospitality. All right. The word Homer uses for scar in this pivotal scene, book 19 of the Odyssey, is ulin. This is a term often associated in Greek literature with trauma, as, for example, in Plato's Dialogue Gorgias, ulas entosomati, hypotraumaton, where ulin means both trace and scar. While the wound trauma is timeless, the scar appears in time. It's a carnal trace which can change and alter over time, though it never disappears. Scars are written on the body. They're forms of proto-writing. A narrative catharsis is a process of working through such carnal traces. Put simply, while the wounds remain timeless and unrepresentable, scars are the marks left on the flesh to be seen, touched, told, and read. Scars are engraved wounds that may or may not be healed. I shall return to this distinction below. And if we have time, I'd be interested in also mentioning and, and addressing the work that's being done on self-cutting, for example, um, and indeed piercing and tattooing as rites of passage where adolescents in confusion need to write on their bodies. Some very interesting work by uh, Pitzer, a psychoanalyst in California, who's worked a lot with, with uh, young adolescents who, who've been abused, and how they write on their bodies by cutting their bodies, usually their arms. And uh, he encourages them to see it as a form of hieroglyphics and eventually to move from, from, from writing on themselves to writing on paper. And it's quite extraordinary, the transposition from self-writing your own body to, to writing on paper and, and also eventually accompanying that by speaking, the so-called talking cure. So it's narrative and touching. And all too often since Freud, uh, talking cure has become much too disembodied, arguably. In any case, how in the light of all this does Homer's epic compare with Joyce's parody of the same epic? Quite apart from the fact that we have leaped 3,000 years, the father-son idea repeats itself. But the repetition is forward, not backward. That's what writing can do, give a future to the past. Joyce's narrative invites a release from the haunting cycle of trauma. The story of Stephen and Bloom recounts their respective efforts to escape the loss of absent parents, Stephen's mother and father, dead dead mother, absent father. Remember, half his, two of his sisters, at least, are, are famished in the course of the book. They're, they're hungry, they, and uh, pathologically hungry. And the departed son, in, in the case of Bloom's prematurely departed son, Rudy. And Bloom, of course, carries ghosts around, too. He's got his potato, which is a memento of his mother, the talisman of the famine, but also of his mother in exile. And, of course, he carries the memory of his father who was traumatized, who committed suicide. They both, traumatized father, traumatized son, seek a new bond of spiritual paternity filiality, but they cannot find it as long as they remain captive to their illusions of what this should be. Stephen's fantasy of a perfect fusion and Bloom's obsession with his lost son, Rudy. Only when they accept their condition of wounded finite beings, Stephen breaking with the literary elite of Dublin, uh, 
Gogarty and, and Co. in the National Library scene. And Bloom returning home to Molly with, as Joyce tells us, less envy than equanimity, less jealousy than abnegation. Only then can arise a love beyond illusion, or the possibility of it. Surrogate father and surrogate son exchange stories of failure and mourn lost illusions in the famous Ithaca exchange. Such love beyond loss is only a hint, of course, a glint in Molly's maternal eye, but enough of a narrative catharsis, perhaps, to give the reader hope in another day, in beginning again. Child man weary, man child in the womb, the phrase Joyce uses for Bloom curling up at, in the bed at Molly's feet. And of course, as Joyce says in a letter to <clears throat> Valérie Larbeau, Ithac est stérile, Penelope le dernier cri. Ithaca, for father and son meet, is sterile, and he calls it the dry rocks of mathematical catechism. They, they don't get it because they need Molly. There has to be the third. The mother of memory has to be retrieved. Um, and so Penelope, Molly, has the last word. Yes, I will, yes, I will, yes, which is in the future. I will. It's opened up to the future. So, to return one last time to Hamlet, we might ask this. Why does Stephen Dedalus choose this particular story to work out his theory of the father-son idea? Let's take a closer look. I'm going to move quickly so we have more time for discussion. The ghost of King Hamlet asks his son, as I mentioned earlier, to remember something that can't be remembered. So, as already said, the play begins with a tale that cannot be told, a testimony that cannot be transmitted, thereby breaking with the age-old sacred tradition of deathbed blessings passed from fathers to sons. This breakage is an example of what Dari Laub calls the collapse of witnessing. Hamlet, we saw, knows his father's condemned to flames for a secret sin committed in his youth. But his father's forbidden by this very same sin to say what this is. Namely, he's forbidden from telling his story. So Hamlet inherits a double injunction from his father, remember, don't remember, and also from his father vis-a-vis -vis his behavior towards his mother, intervene to stop your mother's incest with Claudius, but don't do anything. Let not thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. No wonder the poor Dane is confused. Thus here, as in many ancient narratives of trauma, blind acts of murder and incest are encrypted rather than confessed. Whence the inheritance of the wound is a mark in one's flesh, what Hamlet famously calls the mole of nature, which one inherits with one's birth. Hamlet spends the entire play trying to catch the conscience of the king, deploying the antique disposition of mask and subterfuge, pun and quip, play and wit, so that he might, in his word, by indirection, find direction out. But without, but working through, but working through the play of language and acting takes time, patience, five full acts. Truth only ultimately reveals itself when Hamlet succeeds in abandoning his illusions about a perfect father. Look here upon this picture and on this, as he says to his mother, holding up the picture of Claudius and saying, look at the satyr and then his father, look at Hyperion, the glorious king. Only when he abandons these illusions about his own perfect father and accepts that he, no less than his father before him, he, Hamlet, the prince, no less than his father before him, is a failed, forked, mortal, finite thing. Henceforth, the readiness is all. Now, this surrender of idealized imagos of the father in this instance reaches its climax in the famous graveyard scene when Hamlet comes to realize that the father who loved him as a child and bore him daily on his shoulders was not as he'd always imagined his natural father, King Hamlet, but the long-buried court jester, poor Yorick. Only then is Hamlet the son ready to act according to something beyond himself, what he calls the divinity that shapes his ends, acknowledging his own mortal condition. Then the readiness is all. And here, as in King Lear, wisdom comes from the lowliest of creatures, the fool, Yorick, and the gravediggers who report the story to him, as is Euryclea, the nurse, the most humble of creatures, and the swineherd, Emmaus, report the truth of uh, recognition when Odysseus returns. Hamlet the son, to return to the graveyard, Hamlet the son dies, after the graveyard therefore, in the duel, the play hints, poisoned by the same sword that Hamlet the father used to poison King Fortinbras on the day Hamlet was born. We're told by the gravediggers that the day Hamlet was born was the day that King Hamlet was not around for the birth. No way. He was off fighting who? King Fortinbras, who dies. 
and we know there are lots of poison swords around because it's the same sword that is used in the duel. To follow this hint of the Grey scene, it was this secret poison which led to the further cycles of killings of kings by kings, Fortinbras, Hamlet, Claudius, and sons by sons, Hamlet, Laertes, and almost Fortinbras, the son. Inhumations and exhumations, cryptings and decryptings, secrets of the grave whispered through the mouths of fools and grave diggers. Now this fatal cycle of repetition only comes to an end when Hamlet himself becomes a sacrificial symptom of cyclical acting out and exposes the wound in his own body where the sword has entered. Note that the fatal wounds of King Hamlet's body, of King Hamlet's body, were never seen or touched by his son as scars. For the poisoned king was, I quote, to his grave untimely sent. His prematurely decomposing body, because of poison, having to be interred without ceremony. Hamlet never saw the corpse of his father, just as Shakespeare himself, as Stephen reminds us, never saw the corpse of his son, Hamlet. The wounds were never witnessed as scars in both cases. Once again, we find a collapse of witnessing, which makes for traumatic delay, Nachtheitlichkeit, as Freud would put. Traumas, therefore, are revisited as ghosts, coming back again and again after the event, revenant, as the French says. It goes as revenant, what comes back après coup, after the event. This phenomenon of delay is extremely relevant, I think, for an understanding of our own contemporary culture's fear around death and dying. In former times, mourners were encouraged to have direct and sustained funerary witness of dead bodies before burial. Think of the Irish wake, for example. And this contemporary culture of death denial is manifest today, where wakes no longer exist in, in really in our culture, most other cultures. This death denial culture is manifest in all kinds of symptomatic avoidance behavior faced with the wounds of disabled and otherwise scarred persons. It's not just the dead, it's also the wounded, the weak, the scarred, the ugly. To take just one example, might not a mass social media phenomenon like Facebook, where we prepare a face to meet the faces that we meet in a virtual climate of mandatory cheer, might this not also prove to be deep down a book of ghosts? Not that I'm against Facebook, but it's, it's to bring it into the 21st century. So let me sum up. Because the son did not witness the father going down into his grave, this absence was engraved in his flesh. The loss, the lack, the gap of the empty grave, the missingness, all this was encrypted as a suppressed rite of memory, waiting five full acts of procrastination to be retrieved. This is perhaps the reason why T.S. Eliot described Hamlet as an artistic failure. It's also the most written about drama in Western culture. And it's also the reason, perhaps, why Andre Green, the French psychoanalyst, describes Hamlet as the greatest literary performance of unconscious trauma and recovery, to which psychoanalysts have been endlessly drawn like kittens to a ball of wool. It reminds me of the fourth da, the kid playing with the wool. There have been over 150 works of psychoanalysis written on Hamlet. Uh, and you can multiply that by 100 when it comes to literary criticism. In short, fathers and sons, sons and fathers. Eventually, it's Hamlet's own sacrificial surrender, which enables the play's other fatherless son, Prince Fortinbras, to live on. To survive the, fa the fatal curse, which goes to the whole revenge cycle for generations. And of course, Hamlet was, was originally a revenge story. It, it's Shakespeare who turned it into a tragedy. The story that could not be told, the impossible story, is finally told, though it took five acts, and is an appalling failure, dramatically, according to T.S. Eliot. And the closing words of the fifth act are delivered by Fortinbras himself, finally set free by Hamlet's sacrifice to recover the cryptid memory of his father. What does he say? He says, I have certain rights of memory to this kingdom, which now to claim advantage doth invite me. Memory and story cross in mourning. And if there's catharsis for us, the audience, it is indeed a purging of pity and fear. So let me conclude with a number of remarks and I will move rapidly to this conclusion. A lot more could be said about narrative catharsis, but I don't have time to do it here. If I had, I would have talked about how Joyce rewrites Aristotle's notion of catharsis in Portrait of an Artist. Um, how for Aristotle, 
catharsis was, is what happens not to the authors of, of drama, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and so on, Euripides, but the audience. It's catharsis, something experienced by the audience. Whereas in the case of, of Joyce, Homer, Shakespeare, uh, I'm suggesting it's not just the audience, it's also, uh, you know, physician heal, it's also the author. So it can go in, in both directions. Myself unto myself to give this name catharsis purgative, I quote Joyce, bringing to tavern and to brothel the name of witty Aristotle. So he knew he was reworking and rewriting writing Aristotle's notion of catharsis. Then there is the question, again, which I will not have time to go into, of the respective therapeutic roles of imagination, cognition, and emotion written about by Paul Ricoeur and others. There's the question of the limits of catharsis. Uh, what can be said in terms of traumas, let's say Holocaust traumas, and what needs to be left unsaid? And there are many, Judith Herman in the case of, of rape traumas, her work, uh, Trauma and Recovery, has had a huge impact in North America. Um, and then people like Claude Landsman and Beryl Lang in relation to the Holocaust, who simply say narratives are out of order. You know, after Auschwitz, Adorno's right. You cannot write poetry, you cannot write drama, you cannot write fiction, you cannot write philosophy. And yet, as Levinas, the Jewish philosopher, says, if you remain silent about Auschwitz, the Nazis have won, because that's what they wanted. That's what Himmler committed uh, the SS to in the Swansea Convention. Silence. Nothing must remain of this. Get rid of all the traces. It's a paradox. I would like to repeat in closing that we need to think about the genuinely cathartic role of trauma stories as requiring open narratives that never end, rather than closed narratives that presume to wish away wounds rather than working through scars. Trauma narratives are by their very nature truncated, gapped, fractured, inconclusive. They may be great stories, but they can never offer terminal solutions. And sometimes the dangers of commemorations, national commemorations, centenary commemorations, is that they become such a capital C commemoration that it becomes blocked. The gaps, the, the, the scars are, are not visible. It becomes a triumphal sort of recapitulation of a former event. So that's always the challenge of any commemoration, of any memory. Uh, at a national level, collective level. There are no total cures. Writings can only work through traumas as traces, revisit them as hauntings. They can never fully retrieve such experiences or tell the full story. In the transposition from inexpressible wound to written scar, there's something lost in translation, always. Why? Because the wound is precisely that which could never be properly registered or recorded in the first place. It's what Ivor Brown famously called inexperienced experience. If you could experience it, you wouldn't be traumatized. You could process it. But it's precisely because it remains as a gap, as a silence, as a wound, as an empty grave encrypted within you that the work of scarring needs to take place and the work of writing. It was because it was too much to experience that trauma repeats itself as lack. Trauma narratives are scabs over the cavities left by inexperienced experience. Recall, in conclusion, very briefly, our three stories. The trauma inherited by Hamlet, namely his father's murder by Claudius, on top of his father's sin, committed on Hamlet's birthday, is something hinted at in the play. It's never openly stated. Moreover, the fact that his father's death and burial are missed by Hamlet, who was away in Wittenberg, is a further token of inexperienced experience. And this is linked in its own murky way with Hamlet's mother's incest with Claudius. Secrets everywhere, plays within plays, cipherings and decipherings. Shakespeare's drama engraves traces of buried trauma, which Hamlet resolves to exhume as in the gravedigger scene, but never finally exposes. Many bodies are rotten and rotting in the state of Denmark, from its eponymous king to the disappeared Polonius. But they are all hidden away, behind walls and wainscotings, lies and disguise, screens and seams. Seams, madam, I know not seams. All we have are odors, ashes, illusions. He smells Polonius going up the stairs. Oblique ciphers left deciphered than played with, like cotton reels, forta, or gallows wit, the gravediggers. In this sense, the play's very success is its failure. Hamlet's manic, melancholic words swarm like bees over the black hole of an empty hive, but they can never fill in the gaping wound. Only, at best, conjure and confront the invisible ghosts within. 
The narrative of catharsis comes ultimately not from the cognition of discovery. We never know exactly what happened to Hamlet's father, but rather a curiously liberated recognition of recovery. Failing to gain full knowledge of his father's unspoken crime, very laconically mentioned in Act One, Hamlet nonetheless comes to acknowledge the limits of his own finite, humble existence, his crucial lesson in the grave scene. Indeed, the fact that King Hamlet's hidden story the real reason he's condemned to purgatory, remains buried throughout the play, only returning as a spectral intimation. Itself performs Prince Hamlet's inability to discover his own story, and by extension, our own ability as audience to discover the unfathomable story of the play. Hamlet's a tragedy of trauma. It recounts the impossibility of saying the unsayable. And it's only finally, of course, when he is wounded and dying that he can say to Horatio, absent thee from Felicity a while to tell my story. And Horatio presumably told the story and it finally got to Shakespeare who carried on the story and we're carrying it on again here today and it will be acted out no doubt here by Patrick Mason and other directors, Fiech, Machanil and others in years and years to come. All right. Similar issues of unsayability surround the unspoken traumas of Stephen and Odysseus. There are signs here too, but they are equally cryptid. Stephen's overdetermined guilt, Odysseus's occluded scar. And we as readers may in turn hypothesize about the nature of the various authors' own engraved wounds. For instance, what Homeric trauma, personal or collective, lies behind the long forgotten story of Odysseus's inf infantile wound? And why is it also that, you know, if Odysseus is the first great work of Greek epic, following a war, uh, the Persians, the first drama ever written, is following the Persian, the Greek Persian war. Why is it that plays emerge in the gaps left by war traumas? Moving on. How deep was Shakespeare's shame at missing his own son's funeral, Hamlet, or currying favor with an imperial queen, Elizabeth, abandoning his father's forbidden Catholicism? And to give Joyce the last word, what traumas, little or big, may have been reactivated by his incidental mugging in a Roman night street, recalling his mugging outside the Abbey Theatre. Guilt at abandoning his mother and family. Of course, the mother returns again and again as a ghost in Ulysses. The painful break with his city and culture. Or perhaps, farther back still, the untold historical rupture inherited from the Great Irish Famine with its extinctions, evictions, and exiles. And I'll just end with a note on this. I would like to go on longer because here we are in Dublin and the famine is our wound, um, but I'll confine myself to a paragraph. This last transgenerational wound is rarely acknowledged by Joycians, except for most recently great scholars like Luke Gibbons, um, who has done fascinating work, and Maud Elman on these hidden traces, these almost invisible scars uh, regarding the famine in, in Ulysses. But for all its neglect since the publication of Ulysses in 1922, almost 100 years of neglect, it is, I suspect, a key aspect of Joyce's native unconscious. Joyce himself was born in, 19, sorry, in 1882, less than 30 years after the Great Hunger ended, a catastrophe that split Ireland into pre- and post-famine history, witnessing a million dead, uh, another two million banished or in exile, and almost a third of the population uh, between 47 and 1852. Loss, loss, loss. Banishment of the heart, banishment of the home. Joyce's father and grandfather lived through this unspeakable horror, though like most witnesses who survived at home or abroad, the pain of Androchshel, or bad times, as it was elliptically known in Irish, went largely unwritten at the time. So Stephen vows at the end of a portrait to forge in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of his race. Is it not logical if not necessary indeed, that this massive gash in the national psyche would return in his next novel, Ulysses, as an irrepressible haunting, a stammering tale demanding to be heard. This is, I submit, what happens. The references are oblique, but they are per pervasive. If I had time, I would cite here in detail the work of, of commentators like Luke Gibbons on this. But they are pervasive, from Stephen's dead mother's phantasmal returns to Bloom's frequent allusions to hunger, soup kitchens, and potatoes. He even carries, as I mentioned earlier, a potato in his pocket as a talisman. You don't know whose thoughts you're chewing on, muses Bloom. Famished ghosts. Ah, I'm hungry. 
Or as the daughters of Aaron, also called the daughters of memories, sing in the Cirque episode, quote, potato, preservative against plague and pestilence, pray for us. The illusions are multiple, if characteristically muted. Much hermeneutic digging is required. Here, as in Hamlet's graveyard, are Odysseus's wounded childhood. Throughout, wounded authors call for readers, traces for interpretations, hints for guesses, ciphers for thoughts. To sum up, Joyce's narrative of his native psyche shows that past wounds are never completely past, no matter how much one prays to the potato. The psychic palimpsest of personal and historical abandonment finds expression in the ineradicable wounds of what Stephen calls banishment from the heart, banishment from the home. Joyce identified similar experiences of sundering, what he calls sundering, breaking, separating, in both Shakespeare and Homer, whose traumatized heroes are also indelible scars of exile and injury. They carry these indelible scars of exile and injury. Like his literary predecessors before him, Joyce grafted stories onto histories, forgotten, repressed, occulted, or stolen histories. His narratives were secreted from those nightmares of history, which by Joyce's own admission made his writing the last word in stolen telling. Ulysses is, I wager, a tireless literary effort to awaken cathartically from such historic nightmares by, resort, by restoring forfeited stories and bringing ghosts back to life. It is, in short, a work of mourning and recovery, a writing which translates wounds into scars, flesh into fiction, a working through of trauma. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Carney, for that extraordinary paper, um, uh, Writing Trauma. Um, we're not doing too poorly for time. Uh, we started late, and we've been given a little bit of permission to drift um, a little southwards of the deadline. Um, uh, there will be a blue light that will flash, which will give me a cue to wrap things up before the trapdoor is engaged. Um, so so there, there's time now for questions and answers. Um, I will invite you, um, uh, the audience, to ask questions of Richard, who would love to hear from you. Um, to get things started, um, I might ask a couple of follow-up questions um, of my own, but do consider um, anything that you would like to bring to the conversation. Um, and uh, when you do put your hands up, uh, a roving microphone will seek you out. Um, it would be great for the memories of uh, all concerned, uh, digital and otherwise, if you did identify yourself when you got your microphone um, uh, before asking the question. Um, and I'll come back to you in just a tick. Um, but Richard, one thing that struck me with the examples that you were using in this sort of um, very wide-ranging, very incisive paper um, was this notion of cyclical grief, sort of, you know, the, as uh, Ibsen almost put it, uh, the trauma of the fathers are revisited on the sons. Um, it's not necessarily gender-specific. It actually seems to be sort of this generational inheritance of, of, of sin or shame or fault, which is never expressed and, and thus never eradicated. It seems to sort of be perpetuated handed on to either the guilty or the, or the blameless. Um, is there something in our human imagination from the Greeks onwards that we sort of abide by this fatalism that, um, that sort of trauma is, is always running through us like a seam? Well, according to the Greeks, um, the Greek tragedians, not the Greek philosophers, but according to the Greek tragedians, uh, the figures, uh, Antigone, Oedipus, and so on, are, are governed by Ate, the curse of fate. And that is cyclical. But the very fact that it's written about, as Aristotle notes, means that something that's impossible to escape from by being transposed and translated into writing and therefore given a plot, a, a, a mythos, myth means plot, structured imitation, uh, enables us to see what Aristotle called the essence, the idos, the truth of the cycle. And so not to be condemned to repeat it as facts. So that, in fact, he says the, 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 the writer, the dramatist, gets to the truth of, of, of what happens, of action, precisely through fiction, 
when the historian never does, because the historian is caught up in particulars, reciting one thing after another, meta, one thing after another, whereas the, 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 the dramatist, the artist, the poet, recites things not one thing after another, that's history, in fact, but one thing because of another, dia. And it's that movement from the and to the because mm -hmm. that enables us to take a distance from the events rather than being victims of them and through writing to find arguably catharsis, a healing, it's never final and you never cu cure the wound, but you come to terms with the wound. And, and I mean, that's, if the Greeks are right, arguably true for humanity. In the case of Irish woundings, it's very interesting, you mentioned the word shame. There's a fascinating piece written by um, Garrett O'Connor, Ulick O'Connor's brother, uh, who was chief psychiatrist in Baltimore, the hospital there. And he noted, and talking to his colleagues, that the Irish, um, or people with Irish names, sometimes even realized where they'd come from, or you know, they didn't know where their great-grandparents were presenting with, with the same symptoms of what he called, you know, under the term, malignant shame. And this was a complex cluster. I won't go into them all, but it included inferiority complexes, alcoholism, suicidal tendencies, deep melancholy, um, fantasies, talkativeness, um, megalomania that went with the, with the melancholia, and so on. Inferiority complex, a lot of begrudgery, a need, desperate need for approval. Anyway, to cut a long story short, <laughs> he traced this back to... Uh, to a transgenerational trauma. And he found that uh, these were being acted out generation after generation after generation, and that actually could help uh, the patients mm. if, if they could come to some kind of awareness around this. Uh, uh, because if not, it just keeps on repeating itself. In, yeah. Indeed, one of the things that you spoke about in, in terms of maybe sort of what defines trauma was that, that idea that is un unsayable mm -hmm. or um, uh, uh, was it uh, Edmund Burke you quoted who said uh, the, these are things that we must speak mm -hmm. about and yes sort of we, are, we are forbidden to speak yeah. about them. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there something like that sort of you know the, the push-pull dynamic that Hamlet receives from his mm -hmm. kind of contradictory instructions from his father mm -hmm. um, that you're essentially left in a void of inactivity um, uh, that, oh, and unspokenness um, which means that these things will always bubble to the surface because they are not expressed. Mm. And really my question is, is that sort of the function of what art might be for, that art should articulate or express, play them out for us, Absolutely. or have us play out our own Absolutely. Uh, problems? Absolutely. And, I mean, Joyce was the one who said, you know, paralysis, that's what we suffer from. And then he'll hold up the, the cracked mirror so we can see ourselves in that cracked mirror. And he saw himself as doing cathartic therapy for for the Irish people. And since he wanted to hypernicize Europe and Europeanize Ireland, that meant Europe, and by implication of Finnegan's Wake, it was all men, amen. You know, so he was a doctor for everybody, for every man in a way. No man was every man. Um, so yeah, I think Joyce definitely felt, and I would agree, that, um, that that's the function of writing. But it doesn't mean you have to be a Joyce or a Homer or a Shakespeare to be healed. Because everybody writes in their own way, and even the person cutting themselves is beginning an act of writing. And, you know, I don't know whether you have daughters who come home with you know, piercings in their ears and their noses and their tongues and everything else. Um, and that's, that's a way of writing on the body too, and tattoos and so on. Um, so it's important that the writing not just be on a virtual computer, but also embodied. You know, it is a scarring. Scarring is a, is a very essential moment of healing, because if it heals too quickly, and you get the story or the cure or the solution. Freud tried to do that with Dora and she just got worse. He said, I have the answer for you. You're in love with her K. She wasn't, she was in love with Frau K, but that couldn't be said. Freud got it wrong. How could any woman be in love with a woman rather than a man? And so with his false story, he made it worse. And sometimes commemorations mm -hmm. and memorials can at times close things off, whereas it has to be an ongoing process. Uh, I will open to audience questions uh, uh, and I'll hold on to all the questions that I want to ask on the foot of that. Um, there are already hands up. Um, uh, and, oh, indeed, the microphone has found you. Hi, um, Hi. Ashlyn O'Donnell. Hi, Ashlyn. Um, I, I was wondering, as I was listening to you, about what it is to do philosophy and what it is to be a philosopher. Mm -hmm. Because I think I first heard you talking about this in about 1996 in our mm. MA seminar, 
and I suspect it wasn't the first time that you began thinking about it. And I was thinking about this in relation to what you're saying about cathartic repetition as you're returning to these same themes and these same texts looking at narrative, loss, melancholia, and so on. And I was wondering what it is to do philosophy. I mean, you talked about art, drama, poetry, and so on, and the capacity and the difference between that and history. And I'm wondering about what it is to do philosophy and also to be a philosopher in terms of your own cathartic repetition in the sense, your Dirk Arbeiten of working through these questions over and over and over. And thinking about, is it one job of the philosopher to tell the stories of the storytellers? As Adriana Cavarero might say, you know, to relate the narratives of others who tell those narratives. So I'm just wondering what you think about that, given your own repetition and returning over and over to these texts and these themes. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a lovely question. And first of all, I, I confess I repeat myself all the time. <laughs> well, I hope from time to time forwards and not always backwards. But uh, I, 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 I understand your question very well, and it's an excellent question. I mean, I think, I think the answer to the, the last sentence is yes, I agree with that. Um, and actually, that's, that philosophy is a form of storytelling. You know, the, the good philosophers tell a good story. Socrates was a great writer, right? Uh, Freud got the Nobel Prize for literature. So did Bergson. Um, they're, they're great writers, and they tell a great story. I mean, most of Freud's theories are totally false, but they're great fictions, <laughs> and very often can lead to healing. Um, so yes, and Heidegger tells a great story, and the forgetfulness of being with the Greeks, and then the Christians and the Romans bury it, and then we have to, you know, along come the German romantic poets, Hölderlin and Rilke, and they're going to recover it. Great story. Um, so, and, and, and some of the best philosophers of the 20th, 20th century, Sartre, Camus, de Beauvoir, and so on, Marcel, were, were playwrights and writers as well as philosophers. And they were the ones I was always drawn to. There's two kinds of philosophy. There's philosophy as a solution to everything. It's an analysis that will give you, um, you know, propositional arguments and foolproof logical syllogisms, and that's fine. It's a tool for thinking. It's not the philosophy I'm interested in. There's then philosophy as therapy, as, as Socrates first said, it's the Socratic tradition, to know thyself is to heal thyself. And that's carried right down to Wittgenstein, you know, through Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics, uh, right down to Wittgenstein, who says the whole purpose of writing the Tractatus is to heal people. So he just said, I'm kind of a failed doctor. I wish I had done medicine, but I didn't. So I'm doing philosophy, just as Joyce kind of failed his philosophy, or his medical exams, didn't he, and physics and so on, and then became, became a writer. So there are kind of doctor writers and doctor philosophers. Almost always kind of those second kind of philosophers are pretty narratively based, and I think in my case I, I veer towards narrative and sometimes dip into fiction and feel an increasing need to do so sometimes because philosophy is really differs from fiction drama, poetry, novel, uh, in that it, it goes more towards the fear than the pity. That is to say, more towards the distance of knowing and understanding and explaining than to the pathos of pity in the catharsis equation. So I think philosophy needs to be brought back more and more again to, to the pathos of, of suffering and woundedness. And one thing I loved about Sartre, I think the reason I continued, to, I started to do philosophy when I was a kid in Glenstall Abbey, I read Sartre, and suddenly there he was saying philosophy with the discovery of phenomenology, back to the things themselves, the phenomena with Husserl and Heidegger. He said, now we can, we can philosophize about a street lamp, an ashtray, our own hands. And he might have added our own wounds. And that seems to me to be very important. And one of the most beautiful books written by Derrida, who could be very abstract, was actually Sir Confession, which was his autobiographical philosophical book, which is a, is, it's a confession. But in, in the word circumfession, there's also his circumcision as a Jew, his wound that had him expelled from school in, in Vichy, France, in North Africa, and that sort of followed him right through his life, even as an atheist. It, it's the mark in his flesh. His woundedness, his fragility, his, his feeling of being an outsider that really fueled his work as a philosopher. So I'm all for bringing philosophy back to the pathos of, of the flesh where possible. But it is a different language game to fiction per se. 
more distant, more on the side of distance and less, and, and perhaps wisdom and serenity, wouldn't we love that? Um, and less on the side of kind of the, the more immediate touching and feeling uh, of Argos and Eurycleia. So time is uh, moving on. There is a question uh, about midway up, the gentleman with his uh, arm extended. Hello, Richard. Uh, uh, if you were to give advice to uh, the state, or indeed advice to the Abbey Theatre, or advice to artists around around commemoration, you know, around the fixation of dates and around centenaries, and particularly your work uh, uh, where you seem to be you seem to be on the side of fiction rather than um, relativism or, or, or historical account, could you just maybe? issue a diktat from the Abbey stage and <laughs> how we might should proceed. First of all, don't invite this guy to review any more of your plays, right? <laughs> they, they don't invite me, I just show up. <laughs> uh, I never read any of the reviews, but I, I'll buy your collected works now, so, <laughs> Peter. Um, That's a contract. Do you know, I really, I'm, I'm very honoured and flattered by the question, but I can't think of anything, you know, except... <laughs> As a philosopher, perhaps any any play, any drama that can get the right balance between pity and fear. You know, if it becomes too much Elias pity, then it's going to become sentimental and it's going to become um, lacrimose and soft-centered and so on. I mean, you think of a commemoration that can become just that. You know, 1916 commemoration, the commemoration of the walls of Derry, the commemoration of Lark, and the commemoration of the famine. It can go in that direction. There are famine memorials that are incredibly pathetic in the sense of the pathos of Elias, and not at all, at all enough distance. Whereas, for instance, one that works, and there are several examples of this actually in the Famine Museum that was curated by Neva Sullivan in Quinnipiac University, that was opened last year, where you've, you know, you've got, now I'm talking painting, but Michael Farrell, Brian McGuire, Alan O'Kelly, um, Bobby Bala, some really extraordinary pieces of testimony, in this case visual testimony, sometimes visual verbal actually, because text is used, that gets the right balance. It's not sentimental and kind of a tribalistic uh, fusion um, and an emotionalism because that's very easy to provoke. You put enough images on the wall and everybody's crying or else reaching for a gun. Um, that's the excess of, of the pathos of pity. Um, so you need a certain kind of distance. Brian Tully gets it really right, it seems to me, in his Irish Famine Memorial in New York, where he transplants a, um, a ruin from Schlievemoor in Achill, the deserted village, and reconstructs it in, you know, Basby, in, in downtown New York, right beside the Jewish memorial and looking out onto Ellis Island. So it's kind of this open space, open to the weathers so that it's changing all the time. And then inside he's got these various inscriptions by Lord Trevelyan and Daniel O'Connell and so on. And it's an amazing mix of you're in it, you're suffering, but you're also distant, you're understanding. Um, so what those are, you know, what they're doing with, with visual art, and with sculpture, I suppose, in the case of Brian Tolley, or architecture, in famine memorials, that would be the challenge for Irish writers. I think Tom Murphy, you know, did a pretty extraordinary job in that regard. The work of Brian Friel and, you know, Mary Raftery and so on. I mean, I, I unfortunately have, because I've been away in Boston, haven't seen many. I think my, last night was the first time I was in the Abbey for something like 15 years. So I'm kind of out of it. Uh, but I would say, as a formula, Aristotle is pretty, I, I don't think it's ever changed as kind of the best advice ever, ever offered to get the right degree balance of estrangement, you know, which can go too conceptual, too abstract, as sometimes conceptual art goes. You just lose it. It, it loses matter altogether. It loses the body. It loses touch. Or you can go too embodied and lose thought and the, the right, you know, balance is, is really what might make for the most challenging work. Uh, we are running fast out of time, so we maybe take one more question. Um, perhaps over there. Sorry. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was me. Okay. Whoever has the conch, uh, the, the microphone. That's okay. 
I think actually. So okay, go on. Okay, yeah. sorry. I think we started. Um, we started ten minutes late. We're about ten minutes over. So oh, are we? Oh, it's over half past. Okay. Okay. Does uh, the question arise? Yeah, no, I go ahead. Okay, please. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, just, uh, yeah, very brief, but uh, just a couple of questions. Um, you, you concentrated, yeah, will be brief, concentrated very much on the physical scars and wounds. Um, um, could you say something about the invisible scars? I mean, like, just in relation to that. Um, the other thing is, uh, you're probably aware of a lot of other responses to earlier Irish literature, um, 19th century. Um, Bram Stoker is, there's work um, in relation to Bram Stoker, also sings play by the Western world, uh, Beckett's Endgame, in relation to the famine as well. I would just wonder if you're aware and if you have any thoughts on that. And then also in, in, in commemoration, um, You've mentioned about uh, being cautious about um, very, you know, sort of state and, and uh, sort of official and, and too respectful sort of commemoration. Um, is there a danger also in responding to the past of maybe going to the other slight extreme of a certain, because we have difficulty with some of the uh, past experiences and because of maybe a response to, to the life of the state, um, uh, that it maybe degenerates into mockery. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, very, very briefly, um, I'm sorry, that has to be the last question, and, and I, I will try to be as brief as I can. But anyway, uh, if I could divide them into three um, invisible scars rather than visible scars, I mean both. I didn't just mean scars on the body. I meant uh, psychic scars, invisible scars, absolutely. Um, so... In fact, I was primarily talking about, about psychic, psychic scars. Uh, and I would just add one sentence. Sometimes when a wound, physically or metaphysically, is covered up too quickly, it doesn't undergo a necessary process. I've forgotten the exact medical word now. It'll come back to me in a moment. Uh, which is for the tissue to swell in such a way that it fills the cavity. If the skin covers op over too quickly, without the fibrillation, I think it's called, taking place, it has to be opened up again. And the air has to get back into the gap, the pocket, because it becomes poisonous. So it's a very delicate, scarring is a very delicate process of healing where time and space are absolutely crucial. That's just the first point I would make, psychically and carnally, somatically. The Brand Stoker I'm not aware of, but would love to know more. So maybe you can, you can share your, your knowledge on that. I'd be very interested. And lastly, commemoration. I wasn't suggesting that it shouldn't be respectful. I was just suggesting it shouldn't be triumphal or boring or stereotyped. I mean, it's as if you should come along every so often and knock down, you know, Nelson's Biller and rebuild it. I mean, I'm not pro I or anything. I'm just saying, you know, give, <laughs> you need and famine memorials and anything, you know, holy statues. The Reformation had a point. As long as you build them up again. Um, and, and so commemoration sometimes is most respectful when it remembers but also leaves something unremembered, something still to be remembered, still to be translated, still to be written, still to be inscribed, recorded, embodied. And it's that kind of balance so that the commemoration doesn't go into the upper case too quickly. Um, and, and yes, of course, if it does, then the predictable uh, reaction very often is mockery. And that's not enough because that kind of cynical reaction to any form of authority, any form of nationalism, any form of the state can become very puerile and very um, dis not only disrespectful but actually destructive. So boring triumphalism and boring cynicism and mockery are equally to be avoided I think, where possible. To remember in the right way. You can remember too much and you can remember too little. So it's getting the middle way where possible.
It, it's heartening to, I think, consider the theatrical history, which has tended to avoid uh, boring triumphalism or boring cynicism, and tended to sort of work in the margins to deal with sort of personal and emotional truths and sort of large events. Uh, Plow the Stars being kind of a, a, an obvious example. You, you said before that um, individual lives aspire to the condition of narrative, that the, the unnarrated life is not worth living. I think uh, you, you adapted Plato's maxim. And perhaps that addresses Fiek's question a little as well, the, the notion that fictive strategies or narrative strategies applied to historical events are a way of not of making them ersatz or fake, but rather something truer, something that resonates with us on a, a kind of a personal level. Um, I, I'm afraid that really is all we have time for before they open the gunge tanks. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, 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 attending this fantastic keynote. Thank you very much, Richard Carney, for your excellent paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.